live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman, that's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. And here's what we're watching this afternoon. We're an hour away from the closing bell on Wall Street, and stocks are cutting their losses heading into the close. The tech-heavy Nasdaq inching higher as investors wait for key economic data and the start of earnings season later this week. And the call of the day. City says it's time to hit the pause button on Netflix. The banks say expectations are high for the streaming giant, and the opportunity for gains is stalling. The analyst behind that move joins us later this hour with the three reasons why he is lowering his rating on that stock. Plus, the latest edition of Goodbye or Goodbye. We're going to talk commercial real estate, and we've got to look at which area within this sector might be the best pick for your portfolio. Let's catch up to speed on the market action right now. Now, as we said just a moment ago, we've got the NASDAQ flirting with gains right now after a lousy start to the year, a comeback yesterday, and sort of we'll see today, right? Up 10, a tenth of 1% right now. The S&P still in the red, however, down by about the same amount, and the Dow taking a hit of about 180 points off a half a percent. As I look across what the push and pull is in today's session, as evidenced by the strength in the NASDAQ, we are seeing gains in the infotech sector as well as communication services. The drags today are coming in commodities, folks, as we see oil prices pull back. The energy index is down more than 1%. Materials are are also taking a hit. Financials are down today as well. And of course, we start to hear from the big banks in terms of earnings on Friday. So you mentioned the tech sector. Now we got some, some possible deals in the tech sector yes. too. Let's hit on those. HPE specifically nearing a deal to buy Juniper Networks. This is according to reports, a move that would bolster HPE's AI offerings. The news coming after a weak year for M&A volumes with deal counts continue to steadily decline from 2021 highs, but a boost in fourth quarter activity could be cause for deal making optimism in 2024. So Julia, this one is interesting. So the journal is reporting that HPE in advance talks to buy Juniper, Juniper for about 13 billion. Of course, Juniper is best known for selling those switches and routers, but they also do have this AI business um, that's growing nicely, and that perhaps has caught the attention of HPE. Of course, we also have these reports, Synopsys perhaps making a move for Ansys, so that raises these questions. Could deal making perhaps be starting to heat up a little bit in the tech sector, or at least certain verticals within the tech sector? Yeah, and it's interesting the reaction in this particular situation. Juniper shares moving higher, seeing their biggest one-day gain in a while, HPE under pressure. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I don't know if other companies will be dissuaded by one day's market action. Probably not. Uh, but I think that uh, the prices that are going to be paid in these cases are going to be important as they usually are. But just kind of looking then at the prospects for what this signals about this year. We keep talking about AI. What's mm -hmm. going to happen in AI? Is that going to now uh, drive some more deal making activity. Deal making was pretty lackluster last year in technology specifically, but also everywhere. So I think there are a lot of questions being asked now. There was a Goldman Sachs white paper that came out in October or so of last year, and they said really what we need to see before we see a big uptick in that MA activity in AI is that AI needs to shift further, they say, from proof of concept to production before we get this period of elevation. M&A activity. Why? Because acquirers might want to wait a little bit to see what's actually going to be a winner, what's actually going to make money before they start to make bigger moves. We did talk to some bullish analysts, tech yes. analysts, and I, I, I would bring up Mr. Dan Ives in that, who when, when we were talking about AI, very bullish because he thinks this is the year when we start seeing this ramp in use cases, ramp in monetization. So that'll be an interesting uh, trend to watch there. With HPE and Juniper, I did want to mention for viewers too, though, because, you know, listen, when we talk about the tech sector, there's been some challenges here. It's, it's the cost of capital, but also it's the regulatory backdrop, which we know has gotten tougher, Absolutely. both here and abroad. I, I checked in with Patrick Moorhead, Longtime tech analyst, uh, nobody knows enterprise better than Patrick. I just wanted his quick take on the mm -hmm. HPE Juniper. He would not see, you know, any big reg regulatory issues here. His point being, you know, if these reports are true, two companies in two different markets, edge networking and data center networking, we'll see potentially if we see this deal happen. And the journal says maybe as soon as this week, how do regulators feel about it? Yeah, that's going to be definitely a big question. You know, these are two sort of mid-tier players, so there's maybe less fewer questions around this than there would be For sure. around some of the more dominant players here, but we will keep watching it. And of course, 
bring folks the news if and when it gets confirmed and it is happening. Well, one of the Fed's more hawkish members, Governor Michelle Bowman, indicated Monday that rate hikes are likely over over thanks to progress on lowering inflation, though she did warn that risks remain. Thursday's CPI print will give a crucial read into the Fed's inflation fight. With more, we're joined by Jim Schmiegel, who is SEI Chief Investment Officer. Jim, thanks for being here. Um, and, you know, what is CPI, is, how pivotal is CPI going to be here? Uh, well, thanks for having me. Uh, certainly all eyes are, are going to be on it. The Fed is uh, absolutely data dependent. You mentioned uh, Bowman, uh, really thought of as a hawk. So, uh, you know, she was really one of the last kind of holdouts to kind of acquiesce a bit into this pivot, probably a little bit of a strong word for her commentary, but pretty much close to it that we we have reached the end of the, of the tightening cycle. So, from here on in, it's going to be accumulation of data. Of course, it's not going to be any one release, which is going to, I, I think, move the Fed uh, off of uh, their trajectory. Uh, but uh, CPI, important, PCE, important. Everything here on out is going to uh, uh, you know, be another information point for the Fed and for the market, which, of course, you know, right now the Fed and the market are a little bit they're a little bit further apart in terms of uh, how they view or how they're viewing rate cuts for 2024. And Jim, let me just pick up there. I mean, do you think markets are too optimistic here in, in their interest rate expectations? We do. Uh, we're, you know, we're looking at right now, uh, you know, we ended the year about 160 basis points of cuts priced in. That's come off a little bit into the new year. We're about 140 to 150 cuts priced in. Fed's at 75 basis points. We're definitely more in, in the Fed's camp uh, than in the market. Th this idea that we're going to achieve this near perfection landing uh, and the Fed's going to enact uh, what are really become known as normalization cuts, not not from a stimulus standpoint, but just because they're able to, that there's enough of an air pocket between where inflation is today and where Fed funds are that they can slowly drift this down. Uh, you know, we, we think that's a little too Pollyannish. Uh, and our expectation are, sure, we've seen the trends of inflation. They are off the highs. However, services wages and and quite frankly with what's going on with shipping right now we may even have a bit of a revival of goods inflation so we think the fed is going to take a much more of a slower go approach you know jim just using sort of anecdotal evidence you are among many many people who we've spoken to in the past few weeks who have been saying this same thing why is the market still pricing in as many cuts as it is when seemingly everybody we talk to doesn't think they're going to cut that many times I think that's a great point, Julie. And, and, and to be honest, it's the same thing as it's a repeat of 2023. If, if we'll recall, if we wind the clock back 12 months, we were in the same position. The market had uh, Fed cuts priced in. I think myself and a lot of other talking heads out there were saying the same things that we don't see uh, cuts in 2023. We didn't get cuts in 23. We, we actually saw additional hikes and the market didn't care. The market rallied 20% based on a lot of other factors, such as the AI fever that we were that you were talking about uh, earlier. So, you know, I think it's a great question, which is what does the bond market see? And there's a few different ways to look at it. Uh, the bond market, quite frankly, might be a bit more negative than the equity markets, not necessarily expecting uh, this uh, soft landing. Uh, the bond market might be looking at it from a stimulus standpoint to expect a little bit of a, uh, of a downdraft in economic activity that really equity investors don't seem to be pricing in at, at this point in time. There is a lag to monetary policy. There's a broader lag to monetary policy this cycle, just given where we started from, with corporate balance sheets in great shape, with debt termed out, I think that I think the bond market has a little bit more of a negative overtones to it, and are thinking that you know what, this isn't going to be a perfect kind of scenario, and there could be bumps along the way. Not mentioning the fact that, from a supply and demand perspective, quite frankly, you know we have a lot of debt we have to float in 2024. So I, I, I think it's there's a little more of this dual personality. Equity markets are very, very positive. I think the bond market, you're seeing that skepticism uh, and the cuts that are priced in are actually stimulus cuts and not actually uh, this idea of normalization cuts, which is allowing these valuations uh, in equity markets to be maintained at these levels. And, and Jim, you know, investors, of course, pay attention to the Fed. They also pay attention to corporate earnings. Earnings season is now upon us here. What are your expectations for this earnings season, Jim? And do you think it could it could it be a positive catalyst for the market? I, I, it's, it's a great point. And it gets back to some of the earlier uh, comments that we're talking about. Double digits earnings growth uh, priced in for 2024. Honestly, we're going to take the under on that one. Uh, I, you know, I think there, there's a there's a lot of early warnings that are coming that we're seeing from from economic growth, from small businesses, 
that leaves us, quite frankly, a bit skeptical uh, that we're going to be able to reach these kind of lofty levels uh, that we see baked in the cake at, at this point. Uh, and given that they are baked in, you know, that's also going to give you a sense as to you know what we see from an equity market perspective, very much sideways uh, kind of range bound trading this year. Uh, and, you know, I wouldn't say we're we're outright negative calling for a, a downdraft, although it wouldn't surprise us to see that at, uh, at the, certainly in the second half of the year. Uh, but we're certainly not expecting anything resembling what we saw over the prior 12 months. Jim, as I mentioned, um, when I was talking about what's going on with markets today, we've got financials under pressure. Banks are reporting later in this week. I know that financials is an area that you are focused on right now. Is it an area that you would be adding to ahead of earnings? I think it is. Uh, it's really, if you look at it from a valuation perspective, these are just very, very attractive levels uh, to be looking at financials and adding them to your portfolio, whether it's broad-based financials or, or banks in particular. You know, forward PEs are really not challenging at all, and that's on an absolute basis. If we look at that relative to some other sectors or even to the broader market, uh, they are, quite frankly, on sale. So, uh, you know, we're not looking at uh, adding to financials with any kind of three-month or six-month target. For long-term investors, this is, uh, this is a good opportunity to pick up very, very high-quality companies at extremely reasonable valuations. And so, Jim, so, so that's what, what you find attractive. What don't you find attractive? Which sectors would you avoid here? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing from our perspective this year is we really like diversification. And therefore, what we find not terribly attractive is concentration is the opposite of that. So, you know, along the lines of probably everyone uh, talking about uh, Fed cuts this year, Probably the other topic that everyone's talking about is the Magnificent Seven, the dominance from a market cap perspective. If you're an index level investor, you know, you're getting a 30 plus percent of your investments are in just seven names. That's something that we would like to fade. There's a lot of optimism, a lot of the points that we've already discussed priced into the Magnificent Seven at, at this point. These are great companies. There's no doubt about it. They they can continue to scale. There's no doubt about that. It's just a little too much idiosyncratic risk. We've seen that flare up uh, in weeks past with the Apple Watch. We still have uh, antitrust uh, suits going on relative to Google. We would rather diversify that idiosyncratic risk and have a little bit more of that uh, kind of diversified exposure. So that's kind of what we're fading. What we don't like is highly concentrated equity positions in 2024. Jim, thanks so much for joining the show today. Appreciate the time and the insight. Thanks for having me. Moving on, let's get to some trending tickers now. We're gonna start with Tesla here. Now, the stock is slipping in today's trade, Julie. Of course, we're going to put that one in context. It's still up about 100% in the past 12 months. But there were some interesting stories just broadly about the EV market worth paying attention to. One was from Bloomberg today. And we, listen, we know and we talked a lot about how consumer demand for EVs seems to perhaps be waning a bit, at least in North America. What, what Bloomberg was reporting on, and obviously there's different reasons for that we've gotten into in terms of price and others. What Bloomberg hit on today was kind of noting how the rapid growth of China's EV market is now starting to slow, too. The economy over there we know is shaky. That is impacting, no surprise, consumer sentiment. So they noted that shipments of battery electric and plug-in hybrid vehicles to dealers expected to increase 25% this year. And that is down from 36% in 2023 and 96% in 2022. So you kind of start thinking about what, what does that mean for EV makers now in terms of sales targets, in terms of for their pricing pressures, price wars, and profitability. Right, and this is something also that Elon Musk has talked about, uh, slowing growth of sales, although he's talked more about, it feels like what's going on in here in the US, but obviously China is gonna be an issue as well. Now, probably not affecting the stock, but also floating around out there today, mm -hmm. is a story from Reuters that the company has lowering its driving range estimates. Now, Tesla has been under pressure from regulators about the accuracy of its range estimates. And there have been various stories over the years saying that the company has sort of juiced those estimates or has not been entirely honest about the estimates. So basically Reuters went and looked at their estimates then and now and found that they had in fact brought some of them down. So is that affecting the stock? Probably not, right? So there's sort of some cross currents going on. Obviously a lot of folks are looking at it on the trending ticker page and trying to figure out going into this year, is Tesla one I want to be in? And yeah. today, 
they don't want more people don't want to be in it than want to be in it or at a lower year. price. All those we know to what are run. And interesting we talk about that that market too, because you know, just to bring back to China, we talk so much about the competition for Tesla, including yes. of course BYD. Yes, indeed. All right, let's look at CrowdStrike also. Those shares are trending and they are jumping up 5%. Morgan Stanley upgrading the stock to overweight from equal weight. Analysts there say they see an improving demand outlook for the cybersecurity technology company. Guess what? They think generative AI is going to mm -hmm. be good for uh, CrowdStrike as well and that there are going to be more cyber attacks and that that will help uh, CrowdStrike here. Basically, the analyst saying it's going to be a lead beneficiary of the rising threat environment. That was a quote from that uh, Morgan Stanley uh, Morgan Stanley. Analyst. Yeah, their target goes to 304. They also, you know, as you point out, certainly one bullet here, they think it can leverage and importantly monetize Gen AI. Um, they also know the stock has already, we, we should point out, it is ripped higher here, Julie. I mean, Morgan Stanley is coming in. This thing is up 185% in the past 12 right. months. Um, but obviously, Morgan Stanley is telling clients, listen, they think it goes higher. In fact, how many bulls on the street? Pretty much everyone, Julie. <laughs> two holds, two, sell, uh, two sells, two holds, 46 Buy. So Morgan wow. Stanley has has plenty of company when it comes to CrowdStrike. I mean, it definitely feels like there's a lot of cybersecurity optimism broadly, right? And there are a lot of names in the industry for people to choose from. To your point, I'm going to have to, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to mm. have to look at a head-to-head -head comparison of CrowdStrike and some of its competitors in terms of analyst bullishness and yeah. who kind of wins in that bullishness That's going to be hard to beat for CrowdStrike. That's a lot of fans. I mean, 92%. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's a pretty high percentage. All right, we're going to end it up here with Tilray. Let's check out those shares falling in today's trade. That's despite reporting a narrowing loss and clocking in record revenue. The company, however, still facing pressures from challenges in the cannabis market. We'll be hearing from Erwin Simon, that's Tilray CEO, at 4 p.m. Eastern. So this one's interesting. So Tilray reporting results here. It looks like revenue just beat, narrower than expected adjusted loss, adjusted growth margin for cannabis, 35%. Now, that was 43% in the year-ago period. Uh, they did reiterate, though, 2024 guidance. The alcohol business, though, climbed 117% to $47 million, Julie. And, of course, you know, Tilray acquired those beer brands from Anheuser-Busch last summer. And one big question, though, for investors on this one is U.S. health officials kind of recommending easing restrictions on marijuana, maybe reclassifying marijuana as a Schedule Three drug. That is a big open question for Tilray investors, what, how that plays out there. Right. It, it seems like the Tilray would be poised to sell medical cannabis in the United States, but it doesn't necessarily look like they would get into the recreational business in the U.S. Right now, they operate in Canada uh, in the recreational market. Um, that 114% number sounds good, but to your point, it's because they bought a bunch of stuff. Uh -huh. But this has been part of Erwin Simon's strategy at the firm has been to build up its non-cannabis businesses, including in alcohol and including in cannabis-infused drinks as well. I've been trying to sort of look through the numbers here and try and figure out what happened with the stock because initially it was indeed rising. On the conference call is when the company gave that reiterated guidance for mm -hmm. the full year. Maybe that's an area uh, that investors didn't love here, but still trying to dig in to, and figure out exactly what's going on, and that's something we're going to ask Erwin about as yeah. well. Yeah, you know what else I'm going to ask him about? Vegetables. Right, they sell vegetables They're now. Growing They're growing vegetables, vegetables in Quebec. I'm going to ask Erwin. Listen, he's got strawberries, cucumbers, eggplants, apparently maybe some tomatoes. Basically yeah. monetizing some of that unneeded cannabis cultivation right, space. Right, so that's what exactly. we're gonna, I'm gonna, we have we have things to talk about. I don't know what a about. tomato margin looks like versus <laughs> Ask a cotton margin. Maybe we're going to talk knows. about it. All right. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the newest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be joined by an expert to help you make the best decisions for your portfolio. And Yahoo Finance is out in Las Vegas at CES 2024. Later in the show, Akiko Fujita will chat with Qualcomm president and CEO Cristiano Amon as the, C as the company prepares to launch its AI PC chips. Plus, cannabis and beverage company Tilray, as we talked about, reported its second quarter earnings results. We'll break down the numbers with the CEO, Erwin Simon, in the 4 p.m. hour. All that and more when Yahoo Finance returns.
Bank earnings, they are fast approaching, and there's a new stock that's the least loved heading into its results. Yahoo Finance is Jared Blickery here with the details and the reveal. Who is it, Jared? Morgan Stanley, yeah. um, new CEO. There's some things to prove there. Uh, just taking a look at what happened with the banks today in the stock market, lots of red here. Uh, but I thought it'd be interesting to maybe give a longer term comparison and then get into what uh, we're expecting for earnings. And a lot of these banks are going to be starting with JP Morgan uh, to report results early this week. You can see JP Morgan is up 24% over the last year. It is the uh, best performer among the big, big U.S. banks here. And uh, as far as Wells Fargo concerned, Citigroup and Morgan Stanley, some of the, those have been changing places with respect to analyst expectations. And in fact, Morgan Stanley, as you said, is now the least loved, but it just traded place with Citigroup. And that happened with an HSBC analyst kind of flipping those two within their own uh, ratings. Also, I should add, Wolf Research and Wells Fargo have increased their uh, bets for Morgan Stanley. They have upgraded Morgan Stanley uh, within the last few weeks. And I did mention there is a new CEO at the helm. helm. His name is Ted Picks. And there's going to be a lot to uh, learn from him on the earnings call. And part of that has to do with the fact that it's January and we have the year look ahead update. Uh, but some of this has to do with his strategic goals and they want to get his take on investment managed rev revenue and how that's going to play into corporate results. Um, as far as what the street is expecting, they're looking for EPS at $1.15 and that would be down 12% from the fourth quarter of 2022 revenue up 1% per consensus. Um, when it comes to trading, that has been a big part of the analyst announce, or excuse me, a big part of the results here. FIC trading is expected to be up 5% versus the fourth quarter in 2022. Equities up 4%. And then their fees are expected to be uh, down 11%. And that says M&A is down 28%. So we know M&A has really floundered over the last few years, but we have seen a recently uptick. And uh, let me just show you this. This is a, a comparison of Morgan Stanley versus Goldman. Sachs. I'm going to pivot here. Goes back 20 years, so predates the global financial crisis. You can see Morgan Stanley took a much bigger hit over the crisis and has struggled to come back, but has recently pushed above those predecessor highs or those prior highs there. Uh, meanwhile, Goldman Sachs has done a lot better. However, you take a look at Morgan Stanley versus Citigroup. Citigroup is, uh, has been dead money for quite some time, down 90% from those levels, and uh, kind of an instructive lesson uh, for anybody who's still holding Peloton, for instance, and some of these other stocks like Rivian and um, some others from the pandemic, they have a lot of overhang. And just to say uh, that a lot can happen over 10 years without your stock. So just be careful uh, who you park your money with now that we are coming out of finally that, la that dreaded bear, bear market from last year. Jared, thank you for that. Good stuff as always. Meanwhile, we are, of course, following the latest developments on the Boeing 737 MAX 9 after United and Alaska Airlines found loose parts on their jets. The FAA now saying all of the jets will remain grounded as the jet maker needs to revise instructions for operators to inspect and maintain the planes. Joining us now is Ed Pearson, the Foundation for Aviation Safety Executive Director and former Boeing senior manager who was a whistleblower in Boeing's 2019 737 MAX crisis. Ed, it is great to see you and have you on the show. I want to start here, Ed. Um, listen, you used to work at Boeing, so I'm just curious, when you saw those same images, Ed, that we all did, this door plug blown out midair at 16,000 feet. What did you think, Ed? What was your response? Well, thanks for having me. And uh, yes, um, first of all, it's obviously horrifying to see that happen. And um, we're so grateful that nobody got killed. And, and as many people have talked about, if that plane had been higher, the pressure would have been greater and there could have been, you know, a lot of people um, killed. So. It's, it was it was uh, very disturbing to see, but you know honestly it wasn't a surprise um, given the situation we've been seeing with the Boeing company and the, all the production quality defects. Ed, it's Julie here. Um, so, if I'm not mistaken, you left um, Boeing what in 2019? Is that right? I left um, just before the first Lion Air crash that occurred. So I left in August of 2018. Okay, gotcha. So I'm just curious, you know, now as an outside observer of the company. Um, what do you think they have changed in terms of internal controls, et cetera, at Boeing? 
Well, as an outsider, I, I would say that I think there's been very little changes. Um, that's mostly based on um, people that talk to us. Um, we have um, Boeing employees and former Boeing employees that share information with us. And really, um, the information that we see that comes out in the news um, is, is pretty telling. You know, when we see a, a basically a new production quality defect, it seems like it comes out every, every other month. And we've had uh, at least 20 serious ones that have come out in the last, you know, since the plane was returned to service. So it, it is very concerning. Um, we've also been tracking closely um, uh, safety reports and incidents. So all of this kind of adds up and it, it, it is, it does make you feel a little bit like deja vu and, and, and we're really concerned about it, to be honest. And, and is, Ed, you, you know, listen, you, you've publicly talked about and expressed your concern about quality controls at Boeing. In your opinion, Ed, as, as you make that case, make that argument, what's the reason for that? Are, are they, you know, do you believe they're rushing production? Is that it? Yes, that's exactly it. Um, you know, the Boeing employees, um, you know, when they're properly trained and equipped and uh, have the proper tools and uh, supervision and, and all that and, and technical, you know, quality control, they do wonderful work. But when you put employees like any humans under pressure like that to produce, uh, mistakes are made. And, and unfortunately, shortcuts occur, um, not necessarily intentional, um, but those things happen. And so, you know, in a making an airplane is, is obviously very complicated uh, operation and you have to do everything perfect. And, you know, when you push airplanes down and your priority is to meet delivery goals for the month. And instead of saying, you know, we're going to make sure that the plane has the highest possible quality, that needs to be the standard, right? That was the standard when the company was formed. We, uh, the company has a long history of building um, outstanding products that have last, you know, decades. So this is, this is not the same company that we've seen in the past. And uh, I got to tell you that it, it is concerning, you know, um, sometimes you just got to stop and, and get everybody and, and fix it uh, in position. Uh, there's one thing I'll share with you that happens quite a bit. And that is, as the plane goes down an assembly line, all these people are working on the plane, they're all doing their jobs. And if, um, you know, somebody's parts don't show up that day, well, guess what, that plane is still moving to the next spot. And that employee now has to do their main job, um, their normal job, and then they've got to go chase the plane, you know, we call it out of sequence work. And, and so that's dangerous practice. And I got to tell you that um, the focus is, you know, more on getting um, deliveries out and and, st and share, whole, you know, stock price, which is not really the way you want to measure um, successful aerospace um, so manufacturing. So, you know, it's it's I don't know what to say, but it, it is speech. I'm speechless right now. Well. How do you fix it, Ed, I think is now the question, right? Not, and I'm not talking about this particular issue. I'm talking about how you fix, if indeed the culture of the company has changed, how you fix that. Now, does it mean you, have, you need a change at the top? That person, there was a change at the top, right, in 2020, following the Lion Air uh, disaster. So if that didn't work, you changed at the top, it still looks like you have issues, so then what? It's a great question. Um, and I, I think that, first of all, the company needs to acknowledge the mistakes that they have. And because you can't fix these problems like any company, you can't fix it unless you actually admit. And what tends to happen is there's a, you know, it's kind of a semi admittance and then it, it, it goes out of the news cycle and then uh, promises are broken. Um, and and let's face it, um, any organization, the culture is critical and it is set at the top. And I'm talking, you know, the board of directors, uh, the board of directors and the CEO and the C-suite, um, as I've told other other reporters, they need to get out of their corporate headquarters and they need to spend time with their troops on the factory floor and they need to understand what they're dealing with. And um, it's just, you know, I think there's like two different worlds out there. Um, and if it was up to me, I would absolutely advocate the change of leadership. Um, you know, CEO Dave Calhoun, who I don't know personally, I know has been on the board for years. Um, I've listened to him talk and unfortunately I've seen him um, 
say he's out in the factories and all that. And the people I talk to say, you know, we don't see him. <laughs> so there's some sort of disconnect there. So I really don't have a, a great answer for you. I just think it does come down to leadership at all levels. You know, if you're a frontline employee, uh, we teach this in the military. If you're, you know, if you're a young first line or uh, employee and you see something that's wrong, you need to stop and get it fixed properly. Um, and if your supervisors um, should be supporting you in doing that. And and I think what happens is, you know, employees are push, push, push. Um, sometimes they speak up and they are, you know, things could things, you know, can happen. They don't you know, it, 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 there's things that can happen. They're fearful to speak up, is, I guess is what I'm saying. So um, this is a great, great opportunity, um, you know, for looking at it in a positive way. This is an opportunity to really reflect and, and think about, you know, what's going on with the company. Just changing out a safety officer at the top, um, adding a new CEO, that doesn't change the culture. It, it requires an entire organizational effort. Um, so I don't know what else I can add to that, but that's my thoughts. Ed, it's a big, important story, and we're going to keep tracking it. Thank you so much for joining the show today and for giving us that perspective. Sure. Thank you for having me today. And coming up, a new installment of Goodbye or Goodbye. We're joined by an expert to compare two companies head-to-head -head and help you best manage your portfolio. Stay tuned. Much more coming up on Yahoo Finance on the other side of this break.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. And that's where we help you sift through that noise to figure out the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're focusing on real estate, which had a rocky year last year. A lot of debate about whether it indeed was a good investment and also debate about Maybe it wasn't as monolithic as it looked here. I want to bring in Adam Johnson now of Bullseye Brief. He is going to help us sift through uh, this real we estate se se uh, sector today. So let's focus on real estate investment trusts. And yep. let's kick it right off and look at your goodbye, the, the stock you like here. It's Alexandria real estate here. I actually think it's a great buy, Julie, a as opposed to the buy. other, as are opposed to the to, other. Are we going to have to change the, change the name of the segment? <laughs> great buy or get out of here. Uh, this is my great buy or good buy, um, as you like to say. A couple of bullet points just to get you acquainted with it. Uh, focused. This company builds very specific purpose-built uh, real estate. They um, sell only, they develop only for the um, life sciences sector. So biotechnology companies, big biopharma companies. It's very specialized. These companies need laboratories that's got to have the specialized HVAC, mm -hmm. right, to get poisonous toxins out, um, all kinds of filtering. They like to have production spaces so they can have all their meetings on stage. Um, they do atriums, and this is key, Jules. They only build next to universities so mm. that there's already infrastructure there and a desire for it. So, Interesting. Um, Focused, purpose-built. Right. Let's talk about the second part then. The tenants, you say, tend to stay there. There's not a lot. Yeah. You know, we look at other parts of real estate. People yeah. move in, people move out. Yep. In uh, this one, not necessarily the case? No, because they are purpose-built. In other words, mm. Alexandria won't actually develop a property until it's already um, pre-leased by about 80%. Right? So it's effectively already paid for. That's how they're able to get the loans and lock in the margin. So the tenants, once they ask Alexander to build these properties for them, they stick around. It's very sticky. Okay. And then finally, you say that there is stable cash flow at this point. Because business. of that stickiness. Yeah. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, uh, their occupancy right now, you probably find this surprising. I certainly did until I ran the numbers 96%. Wow. That so for all the gloom level. and doom about real estate, 96% occupancy, and they're renewing leases at 6% um, increases. So uh, I like ARE very much. Uh, all right. I'm long it as are my clients. Okay, that's a good disclosure to have. Yeah. We, we like to ask people what the risk to the potential bull sure. case is. And here you say, could we see healthcare markets get crimped by regulation, for example? Potentially. Yeah, I mean, if, if, if you just, and again, we have to think big picture here, but, you know, if in fact um, the, uh, the Washington steamroller were to uh, really go after drug pricing, I know they always say that during election years, as they are right now, but if that actually were to uh, gather momentum, then in theory that would crimp um, uh, profits at, mm -hmm. at some of these companies, and so they might not be able to spend the money on this premium well, real estate. And the other thing I would ask just briefly before we move on to the one that you would avoid is, yeah. you know, what kind of growth is this company seeing? In other words, because... Six, seven, eight percent annual. Okay, so we're not talking about huge no. leaps and bounds of growth, but a steady grower. A is steady what grower, and here. what attracted to me, you know, I run the Bullseye American Ingenuity Fund. There's right. a lot of technology. You don't usually think of real estate as ingenious, right? But the way they target the real estate, I think, is ingenious. And I would also add that the stock was trading, oh, about six weeks ago at a 10-year uh, valuation low. Oh, you don't often see a high quality company trade that low. Okay, so let's talk about the company that you want to avoid, and yes. it is in the dreaded office. Wouldn't space. touch it. We're Not with a 10 foot pole. SL Green here. That's your <laughs> goodbye. goodbye. So let's run through it here. Concentrated in NYC. I th I, if I'm not mistaken, this is one of the, if not the largest. REITs in New York City. Oh, it's the largest one, hands yeah. down. They own 59 properties here in yeah. New York City. That's part of the problem, Julie. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is the tip of the spear. If you talk about the problems with commercial real estate and office space and the fact that, at least here in New York, only about 53% of workers are back in the building, right? We know so, that anecdotally, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So concentrated New York, um, that's a big problem. Okay, let's talk about problem number two for you, inconsistent property mix. What does that mean? So. On the one hand, SL Green has got some beautiful properties here. In fact, if you know one Vanderbilt right next to Grand Central, arguably probably the prettiest, most impressive new building in New York City. The problem is that's only one, and they're along 59 buildings, and they've got some real duds, like the old Bear Stearns 245 Park Avenue, mm -hmm. a bunch of buildings, big, blocky, clumsy concrete buildings on 3rd Avenue. What do you do with them? That's the problem. So it's an inconsistent property mix. Okay, and then thing number three here, 10 and 50 are in alt 
yeah. strategy. Watch out. You remember um, back in uh, 2008, Citibank had good bank, bad bank. Mm -hmm. They put all the bad assets in the bad bank. Well, they put 10 of their uh, 50 buildings, 59 buildings, in the alternate strategy portfolio. Mm. In other words, we don't know what to do with them. We can't sell them, we can't lease them, they're just sitting there. Do we repurpose them? Do we knock them down, develop, redevelop? Um, so that's a concern, that alt strategy group. Okay, so the risk to this downside case is yeah. Everybody comes back. Yeah, everything's great. <laughs> you know, right? Come back in. The water's fine. Yeah, I mean, you look at the um, Wall Street Bank CEOs, and they've all said, you got to get back right. in. David Solomon at Goldman, on and on. Uh, Jamie Dimon at, at J.P. Morgan, get back in the office. And actually, I'm a believer in that. You know, mentoring happens in the office. It doesn't happen when kids are at home not working with, uh, with peers or with uh, seniors to, uh, you know, show them the way it's done. Um, so if everybody comes back to work, okay, I guess they'll, they'll agree to be just fine. But yes. it doesn't seem to be going that way. It doesn't feel that way. And then we've got sort of a bonus chart looking yeah. at these two companies and really comparing them here. When I we talk this. about REITs, occupancy is really important here, right? What percentage is the op occupancy? And there's yeah. definitely a clear divide between these two guys. Oh, a clear divide. And by the way, hats off to your, produ your producers for making this chart because this says it all, right? Occupancy at Alexandria Real Estate, 96% versus SL Green, 89. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you, you were saying earlier, you're surprised it's as high as 89. It sounds like it ought to be 78, but it's 89, fine. Uh, amount of debt, less than 20% of ARE's debt comes due in the next four years, mm -hmm. whereas more than 60% of SL Green's debt comes due. So they've got this debt problem. They're going to have to refinance, and obviously rates are higher. Yeah, higher rates, yes, And by exactly. the way, um, half of the debt at SL Green is floating rate. Oh, dear. So, you know, they yeah. get squeezed on both fronts. And then you just look at sentiment, the way the street is uh, looking at these stocks. 12 buys on ARE, no holds, only one sell. Yeah. And that's a recent one, versus 4, 7, and 7. So the street doesn't like, I don't like SL Green, the street doesn't like SL Green, and you got to respect that kind of sentiment. I tend to be a contrarian, but not when it comes to SL Green. This is one where I agree with the street, I agree with the market's view, and I don't want to touch it. But ARE, another story. Okay. Adam, I'm going to recap, if I okay. can, what we have talked about today. So you're saying buy Alexandria Real Estate based on that focused uh, portfolio, yeah. the loyal customer base, positive cash flow. And the other side, you say avoid SL Green at all costs based on its not so diverse portfolio of buildings here in New York City, high debt, low occupancy. Adam Johnson, what a uh, pleasure to see you. Great being with you, Julie Hyman. And be Hyman. on TV with you once again. Of course, we'll be back with more Goodbye or Goodbye later in the week. We've got more Yahoo Finance after this.
Shares of Netflix on track to end today's session slightly lower after Citi downgraded the stock, citing concerns about revenue outlook for the year. Netflix shares are up more than 50% in the last year and currently sit right around 480, just below Citi's $500 price target. We're joined now by Jason Bazinet, Citi Managing Director. Jason, it is great to have you on the show. So it was interesting, Jason, because you told your clients, listen, it, it's, it's clear to you and, of course, many others, that Netflix really won the streaming wars. They're both profits and scale and poised to be net debt free, but you downgrade the stock, Jason. How come? Well, you know, it used to be controversial when the stock was 200 a share, whether the ad tier would work, whether Netflix would generate, you know, meaningful amounts of cash flow. And now we're just so squarely in the consensus. Um, and as we looked out over the next two years, there's a couple fears. One is, I think in the fourth quarter of this year, street estimates are a bit too high for the top line. Next year, I think content costs are too low. And then third, there's an outside chance that Netflix does something which the market doesn't expect, and that is pursue transformative M&A. And oh, so presumably you think that that is a low uh, probability at this point? Yeah, I don't think it's a high probability. The, the problem <laughs> is, is that the consensus has the company generating you know, $4 billion plus a cash flow, and all of that is being plowed into buybacks, all of it. And so to the extent that Netflix does anything with that cash flow other than buy back stock, you're going to see the free cash flow per share end up being lower than the street estimates. And, and I'm curious, just let, let's say um, they did really pull the trigger on a big acquisition. What kind of company do you think they could be interested in? Well, for a couple of years now, Netflix has been nibbling at the edges with um, small mobile game publishers, right? They want to broaden the portfolio into video streaming and actually get into mobile games and get people to engage with Netflix, you know, outside of just video consumption. They've also talked uh, quite openly about their desire to uh, get more IP to sort of fuel more interesting um, films and TV shows. And the one area that where that all might converge would be a AAA publisher that has both a big mobile game portfolio and of course, has intellectual property that you could use to make new TV shows or new films. And so Jason, are you, are you suggesting then, hey, they may, they may be interested in making a play for a big publicly traded uh, yeah. you know, video game publisher, EA, a take two? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Right, that's interesting. And so it, it would be, it would, you know, it's one of the things, I mean, the question we've gotten from institutional investors is, would that necessarily be bad? I mean, what if they paid a decent multiple? You know, what if it ultimately created a lot of shareholder value over the years? My point is that may be true. They may pay a good price. It may create value in the long run. The problem in the near term is that's going to dramatically complicate the narrative, right? If there's one thing that Netflix has, it's a pretty simple narrative. It's a very sort of monolithic business model, right? Sign up customers, get ARPU, sell ads. All of a sudden you throw in there, oh, where are we in the console cycle? Oh, how many units are they going to sell of this particular AAA game? Oh, is this mobile game, you know, going to roll over, you know, that maybe did a $60 million a year in revenue. It just complicates the story. And usually complexity is not good for multiples. Okay. So let's assume as you are, that they're not doing this. <laughs> okay. um, at the same time, you've effectively said in your note that they've won the streaming war, right? Yeah. So um, there is a gap, as you say, between the street's perception and the reality of, of where they're priced right now and what they're uh, capable of. So if they've won, is it just that they are not going to grow at the same rate and the street is assuming that that growth is still coming? Yeah. So, you know, the, it, it, you may recall that Netflix went X growth, right, a few years back and they've pulled sort of two levers, right? They've cracked down on the password sharing and they've launched the ad tier. And I think the main question that we're getting from institutional investors is when did both of those, I'll call them product cycles for lack of a better word, run their course? Do they run their course a year from now? Is it two years from now? That's the main question that people don't really have um, a firm answer on. And to be honest with you, we don't either. My only point is if you look at those consensus numbers, the street is assuming smooth sailing for the next two years. And usually in my seat, when I found that nobody wants to own a stock, like Netflix was a couple of years ago, it's time to get constructive. And when everyone agrees that Netflix is the winner and everyone has estimates moving up and to the right and the stock is near an all time high, that's usually the time to step away. And so that's what we're doing. We're just moving to the sidelines, but it's still a great company, great strategy. And, J and Jason, as you move to the sidelines here, what are some, us, uh, you know, just thinking through the upside risks to that call that you see? Well, we've got about, so roughly, 
Netflix has about 270 million subs. Embedded in our model is about 80 million incremental customers coming from around the globe to the lower priced ad tier. Um, I guess, you know, and I, and I think everyone on the institutional side would agree that the ad tier has been slow to roll out, but that's my big fear is that the ad tier actually gets more traction and sort of exceeds street estimates, um, in which case you'd have net ads beat us, beat the street, revenues beat us and beat the street. And that's certainly possible. Um, I just wouldn't put a high probability on that. So Jason, if Netflix is not the one for 2024, what's the one in streaming for 2024? Well, I, you know, I, I'm sort of drawn to Disney, to be honest Ooh, with you. Wow. And, and the, the reason is, is that if you look at Disney's equity value right now um, at $90 a share, the street is essentially paying nothing for their streaming business. Why are they paying nothing for the streaming business? It's roughly two thirds the size of Netflix but it doesn't generate any profits. And the streets, you know, sort of mindset at the moment is if it doesn't generate profits, we're gonna value it at zero. What I'm waiting for is a moment, a year from now, two years from now, where I begin to get questions from the buy side that says, hey, wait a minute, you know, this Disney streaming business, right? It's two thirds the size of Netflix. Why are we putting zero value on it, <laughs> right? I haven't got that question yet, but to me that, that's, that, that sort of speaks to the opportunity. And that's the streaming part, Jason. What do you think Bob Iger ultimately does with the linear assets? You know, linear is challenging. It's highly cash generative, but I don't think that there's a lot you can do with linear. I think the trick is to sort of manage uh, the degradation in a way where you actually have a place to go. And right now, the way the street looks at Disney is linear is shrinking. There's not a lot to do with it, but the place to go doesn't generate profits. Therefore, it's unexciting. And that's what I'm waiting for it to change. But there's not a lot you can do to, to change the underlying trajectory of the linear business. Jason, always love having you on the show. Thank you so much for, for joining us and helping us think through all things Netflix and Disney. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Yeah. Happy to do it. Thank you for the time. More on the other side of this break. Stick around. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with a ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. All right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Investor Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this and we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street. So let's do a check of the markets here as we wrap things up today. We had been seeing stocks sort of bounce around a little bit during the session. Looks like the Nasdaq is indeed going to close in the green after the disappointing result we saw for the bulls yesterday uh, with uh, that uh, or the disappointing result the first few days of the year. Um, a little bit of carry through from yesterday, I should say. The Nasdaq up on the day, just a tenth of 1%. The S&P off by the, about the same amount. The Dow down by about 158 points on the day here. And as we talked about earlier, a little bit of push and pull from tech on the upside and the commodities-related shares on the downside. It does feel like, Josh, that we're in this sort of um, pause period, if you will, right? We've got CPI coming later in the week. We've got bank earnings and other earnings really starting to ramp up uh, right. on Friday and then going forward into next week. So now we're in this in-between period where we're waiting for more economic data. We're waiting for more earnings and investors are sort of just filling the gap, if yeah, you will. Yeah, not, not a lot of news to go off there. And also, you know, not particularly, you know, it's kind of expected you would, might take a kind of pause here after the rip you saw in Q4. But to your point, waiting for the economic data. And then, of course, earnings season, is that a positive catalyst? Or do you get some downbeat guidance from, from CEOs and CFOs? We'll see. Yeah, Jared will be along in a few to tell us about some of perhaps the records and, and whatnot we have seen today. But for right now, the NASDAQ is up for three straight sessions. All right. A little bit of comeback. Let's well, meanwhile, let's get to some trending tickers here. We're going to start with Match Group, owner of dating apps such as Tinder. Shares rising after Elliott Management reportedly building a roughly $1 billion stake in the company. So that's the headline here. Match uh, on the move today. The journal is saying Elliott Investment Management built this stake. Apparently, Paul Singer and the crew there, they have plans, Julie, to get this stock moving higher. We don't know what those plans are mm -hmm. just yet based on these reports. Um, will they be nominating directors? We don't know that either. If you look at the stock, it's kind of tough sledding. It's down about 10% in the past 12 months. Obviously, lots of competition. And then also, we've just heard these stories about the kids, the young'uns, maybe not as interested in the dating mm -hmm. apps, Julie, as, as they might once have been. You know, I'm a f and we both met our partners IRL, as, as the kids say, um, which I'm still a fan of, of that, old-fashioned the way it may be. I mean, when you talk about how the stock has performed, indeed it has been disappointing. Remember, this used to be owned by IAC, Interactive Corp. Um, it started trading on its own, I believe, back in 2021, if I'm not mistaken, and traded at over 150 bucks a share at one point. Um, now, today, it's trading at about $39 a share. So so you can see where um, a company like Elliott would want to maybe see some opportunities uh, to boost that up. It is a lot bigger than the other dating mm -hmm. apps in terms of market cap, in terms of number of users, in terms of the sort of suite of other um, apps. It owns OkCupid, for example, as well. So, you know, we'll see what kind of opportunities Elliott's looking for here. But we should mention, not a single sell on this name on the street, by the way. Not not a single one. And it could be worse. If you check out Rival Bumble, by the way, that stock's down about 30% in the past 12 months. So okay. there you go. Not great. Any way you slice it, I suppose. Um, let's talk to talk about the big M&A, potential M&A story that we have been watching today. And that's Hewlett Packard, according to reports, Hewlett Packard Enterprise on the verge of acquiring Juniper Networks. That move would come as HPE looks to accelerate its AI product rollout. The Wall Street Journal reporting a deal could be unveiled sometime this week, and we're talking about around $13 billion. That's the number that both the Journal and Bloomberg have put here on what HPE might pay for Juniper. Investors don't seem too thrilled about it. In HPE, the shares down pretty sharply on the day. Of course, Juniper shares have been surging here. I think of Juniper mostly as we talked about earlier, maker of switches, maker of routers. They have um, an AI business called Mist AI, which uh, is I love that dramatic flair you just gave that. Yeah, no, that was nice. AI. That sold it. That I sold did. it. Well, all the people can. We got a chart up so they can't see the mist, uh, whatever this hand gesture is for mist. Anyway, um, so mist uses. I'm just going to think of that whenever you talk about AI, though. That's the problem. Mist. That's, that has to do more to do with mist than the AI part. Anyway, it uses AI and machine learning to optimize users' experiences around wireless access, whatever that means exactly. But whatever it is. HPE wants it. Yeah, I mean, analysts who cover the names, it was interesting because they, they they did think the deal when they crunched the numbers could make sense, that $13 billion for Juniper would be a fairly reasonable valuation, in their opinion, that from a financial perspective, 
they again, based on their estimates, they could see how the deal could be accretive. But to your point, this is all about AI. Junior Perino, best known for the hardware, the switches and the routers, but they do have this AI business they bought in 2019. It's growing fast. It's this AI-based wireless platform, and perhaps that's what HP CEO Antonio Neri now has his, his eyes on. The journal says if it's going to happen, we could hear about it soon, maybe this week. So yeah. we'll look for headlines. Juniper shares have not been doing very well. So, no. you know, um, Although, for quite a long time. They haven't. But, you know, when you read through the analyst notes, too, another question they had for Juniper mm. is why now, though? What triggered it? Because they actually, the analysts say they actually are seeing strength in their enterprise market. So mm. another interesting question, question. Why now? Yeah. Yep. All right, let's talk Illumina, shall we? Go ahead. All right, shares of biotech company Illumina popping in today's trading session. The company posting preliminary fourth quarter revenue that did top expectations. Um, one analyst over at Cowan saying this is a good start under the new CEO, Jacob Dason. And it's important that there's a new CEO because... Last year was a drama-filled year for Illumina. It came under activist pressure as well. I'm from Carl Icahn, who wanted it, uh, the company to not buy back Grail, a unit that it had uh, had owned and then spun off and then bought again. And then it ended up, by the end of the year, dissolving that buy, right? The yeah. CEO, who had been the CEO, left. Thaisen took over. Uh, uh, there's a lot a lot. There's happened. a lot of soap opera. So yeah. then, then you did have this new CEO, Jacob Thaisen, and he was CEO back in September because the other CEO, is, to your point, there was this kind of abrupt departure. And, yes. then the, and it was amid the, proxy, the poxy fight and the regulatory headaches. Even with today's pop, though, by the way, the stock still, I mean, it's looking tough here. You're still down about 30% in the past 12 months. Yeah, but even so, they came out with this preliminary revenue. $1.12 billion is what uh, Illumina is now talking about. $1.07 billion is what analysts had been looking for. So, um, again, people looking for some relief. And yep. the company, you know, we should point out, and our Anjali Kamlani was covering it, the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference going on in San Francisco, and you tend to get a lot of announcements from healthcare-related companies in this time that do uh, push around the stocks. So we'll be watching. This is something that came ahead of a presentation they made out there, and so we could potentially get more of those. Yeah, so it sounded like, Julie, so basically it was the Q4 beat, to your point, and the full-year sales, they're going to decline, but decline less than what they figured when they right. last spoke. Yeah, done. Let us talk about another mover that we have been watching today. That is Tilray. The shares are falling today despite reporting a narrowing loss and record quarterly revenue. The company posted sales of $194 million. That's up 34% from a year ago and an adjusted net loss of $2.7 million. Now, it comes as the Canadian cannabis company diversified in August of last year, buying eight brands from Anheuser-Busch, becoming the fifth largest craft beer brewer in the United States. Erwin Simon is joining us now. He is CEO of Tilray. Ray Irwin, it is great to see you here. Um, and, you know, I have to say, we have been sort of trying to um, suss out why the stock is down today. And I wondered if it had something to do with some sort of disappointment that you didn't up your EBITDA guidance. I guess I would ask you first, what do you think is going on here? What is the street maybe missing? So, hi, Julie. Happy New Year. Nice to see you. Always nice to see you. Listen, I came back and step back and yes it is disappointed uh, I think the team has put up a great quarter um, and you know in challenging times and in challenging industry in the cannabis industry and you know with that hey I, I think at the end of the day when investors come back and look at you know our numbers and dive into it I think we'll you know hopefully see some reverse on that but you know we traded over 55 million shares today maybe apple didn't trade that many shares but uh, um, a lot of interest in tilray and uh you know we're really in a good industries so if you come back and look at companies out there today and you know you talk about companies there's not many companies out there today that have medical cannabis recreational cannabis spirits and beer medical distribution and uh you know in the medical cannabis industry so we're creating something that's different we're creating something that's new um the cannabis legalization in the canadian market's been around for five years um you're not able to advertise in there so how do you build brands but you know julie when i got here and you knew me from my hay days you know we're a little over 50 million dollars and we're on a run rate today to be a billion dollar company and Erwin, um, it's Josh here. One, one big question, Erwin, out there is these U.S. health officials recommending um, easing restrictions on marijuana, reclassifying marijuana 
as a Schedule Three drug. How, how do you think that plays out, Irwin? And what, what would it mean for Tilray as a business? It would mean a lot for Tilray. Yeah, you step back, number one, you know, we have a major medical cannabis business in Europe and a major medical cannabis business in Canada. And taking that know-how and taking, you know, all those years of what we built there in regards to working with the medical professions with prescriptions and bringing that to the U.S. would help us tremendously to build a good medical cannabis business here in the U.S. Um, I think it would help bringing in institutional shareholders that actually can hold a stock where a lot of, you know, shareholders today or institutions cannot hold cannabis stock. And it would help us with the banking world today um, because right now any of our profits or proceeds that come from our Canadian cannabis business, and even though you know Canada is legal federally, we cannot use any of those proceeds within our U.S. Uh, operations. So what, I guess, Erwin, what do you think the likelihood then is that, you know, that's something that's been reported upon as a possibility. Where do you think we are a year from now when it comes to regulation? You know, great question. If you would ask me where I think we'd be a year today when, you know, Joe Biden became the president of the United States, I would say cannabis would have been legalized, mm -hmm. okay? Listen, something's got to happen, which is, you know, kind of crazy out there today. You know, cannabis in the U.S. is scheduled the same as heroin. Actually, you know, cocaine does not have the same scheduling. So there has to be a descheduling where cannabis is scheduled as, you know, number three from a scheduling standpoint. If you come back and look at it today, you know, cannabis is legal in 27 different states in regards to recreational, about 10 states, you know, in regards to medical. Over 90% today of the citizens of the United States of legal age want cannabis legalized. So something's gotta happen. It's just our politicians got to go ahead and do it. My belief, and this is nothing coming from any of the lobbyists or anything I know, I believe something will happen in regards before the elections. Now, the question is, from a timing standpoint, would it ever get through Congress and Senate before next year's election? And that's, you know, what, you know, my concern would be. Um, I want to ask you about beer, Irwin, because we talked about beer a little bit the last time that you and I spoke. Um, and we talked about how craft beer has been a little bit of a challenge business industry-wide, right? You guys managed to beat estimates in your craft beer business. And the last time we talked, I said, what are you going to do to beer to make it do better under Tilray? What did you do? What happened in the quarter? What kind of progress are you seeing? And what levers are you pulling on in that business? So I'm happy to report between Montauk, Sweetwater, our Green Flash, Nelson business, um, you know, we were up 10% on our legacy beer business, and that is, you know, with the beer category down. So with that, we got a lot of good innovation out there, and with that, we got a lot of good new distribution. So that is number one. Number two is with the new brands that we acquired from ABI, there's some great regional brands there with Shock Top being a great national brand, and I think Julie, what we have to do within our beer, as I've said before, is make beer a great cool drink. And it's the appeal to Gen Z. It's the appeal to multiple generations. It's the appeal both to males and females. And I think that's the problem where beer has not been marketed you know, to those demographics and has not been marketed to those groups. And uh, it's not just at a concert or a sporting event. You know, I get asked all the time, how does dry January hurt you? Listen, yes, dry January has been around for numerous years, but there's a lot of football going on in January. And so there's a lot of beer and chicken wings being consumed out there. And Erwin, I got to get you out of here on this. You know, we, we talked Erwin cannabis, we talked beer, but I, I got to ask you about the vegetables, Erwin. So Tilray, you're growing vegetables in Quebec, strawberries, cucumbers, eggplants. I heard maybe even some tomatoes, Erwin. When, when does this start and what's it going to mean for Tilray's business? Listen, come back and say this here. Number one, we're focused on recreational medical cannabis in, in the Canadian market. Number two, we're focused on our beer and our spirits business and our Manitoba harvest business in the U.S. We're focused on our medical cannabis and our medical distribution business. We have 5 million square feet of grow. And with that, we do not need all the grow to grow cannabis in the Canadian market. We have a facility that we acquired from Hexo there that was spent 
close to $200 million or plus to build that facility, which is great greenhouses. There's a great demand for vegetables in the Quebec market. And with that, you know, right now, we're going to grow vegetables there where there's a great demand. And whether we continue with that, ultimately divest, that is something we'll see. But we want to go out there and, you know, utilize assets and repurpose them, not just shut them down and go dark with them and where we feel there's a void in the marketplace. But it's not going to be a big part of our business. It's just that we have a major facility today that we ultimately are going to repurpose and we're going to you know, do something with. The same thing would happen with Trust. We acquired a great um, beverage facility from Trust, which was Molson's. And whether it's going to produce non-alcohol beer, it's going to produce energy drinks, water drinks, is something we're going to do with those facilities because we see a void in the marketplace in the Canadian market for that. Erwin, loved having you on the show. Thanks so much for coming on and giving us that time and insight. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, and nice to see everybody, and Happy New Year. And it's not dry January out there for everybody. It's okay <laughs> to have a beer or two, okay? That's just a good life lesson, Erwin. I'm going to take you up on it. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Markets closing mixed on the day, but well off the lows here. Jared Blickery is here with a look back at today's trade. That's right, Josh. We got the NASDAQ ending in the green for the third day, but wasn't a big gain, as you were noting, up about nine-tenths of a percent. And let's just graph the or chart the year-to-date price action so far. Uh, still in the red for the year. The first five days was over yesterday, and that uh, has some negative implications for the rest of the year. But now we're just focused on the rest of January because that also has some implications for the rest of the year. Dow down 42 basis points. And when we take a look at the sector action, only only three, actually only two in the green, staples and tech. Everything else in the red. Energy was the worst off for the second day in the row, by the way. That's down 1.6 percent. That's after that nasty drubbing that crude oil got taken down on yesterday. Materials also down 1 percent. In the NASDAQ, we do see a little bit of green. And guess what? NVIDIA up 1.7 percent. That is good enough for a record high. This is uh, today's price action. Let me show you over the last year so we can see we just had a nice break to the upside record high yesterday and uh, some continu continuation today. So as far as the MAG7 uh, trade was concerned, uh, some people worried that given the first negative price action or given the first negative few days of the year, that was dead. The AI trade back in focus here. But uh, aside from the mega caps here, we do see a lot more red than green. I can focus on the energy market. You can see it there, worst performing sector. You can also see it in the banks. And we're looking ahead to those bank earnings this Friday. So all in all, not the worst day and also not the best. So let's just call it a mix, mixed market. All right. I like that verdict. Thanks a lot, Jared. Appreciate it. Well, we, we have breaking news just coming down. The spot Bitcoin ETFs have been approved. This news coming, by the way, in a tweet from the Securities and Exchange Commission. The tweet reads, today, the SEC grants approval for Bitcoin ETFs for listing on all registered national securities exchanges. The approved Bitcoin ETFs will be subject to ongoing surveillance and compliance measures to ensure continue investor, continued investor protection. What I think is so fascinating about this, first of all, a lot of the participants were looking for approval after the close tomorrow, which is the deadline, at least for the ARC and 21 shares um, application to get approval or denial. But secondly, Josh, this tweet has a nice happy picture of Gary Gensler on it <laughs> yeah. and a quote from him. He says, today's approval enhances market transparency and provides investors with efficient access to digital asset investments within a regulated framework. He has been sort of viewed by some in the industry as a real downer, a bummer, somebody who is not, not a fan. That's not what this picture says. Right, that's not this what this picture Gary. says. That's yeah, happy very, Gary very saying happy yes Gary. to this. So I just think it, it, it's kind of a, an ironic little twist to this whole situation. You know, in 2023, Julie, Bitcoin had a, a strong run after a rough 2022. And of course, you know, different reasons for that. But of course, one big reason was this. It was a lot of Bitcoin fans waiting for this product, waiting for the SEC to green light this product. Now, some interesting questions are going to be what's demand like, right? What, where does the demand come from? Yes. Retail, RIA, institutional. Um, and also, another big question is, is this 
Now, is this another potential catalyst for Bitcoin or the fact that we have been talking about this yes. for so long now with a lot of smart people? Is it actually going to end up more like a sell the news event, at least in the yes, near term? We will find out. I, I will say also, just to lay out the landscape here, there are, a, are 11 issuers who have applied for approval of these spot Bitcoin ETFs. Some of them are very large players in the ETF industry that are now getting into Bitcoin. Some of them are already in the sort of cryptocurrency um, exchange traded product space, either in futures or in other countries that are now trying to get into the spot market. So there, and some of them are large, some of them are small, some of them there's a difference in fees. So now uh, the questions are, are all of them getting approval? This seems to be yes. Mm -hmm. The answer to that seems to be yes. When do they start trading? Not entirely clear when that's happening. And who's going to get the money? Where are the flows going to go uh, with this, these different products? The other question that we have in this whole discussion that we've been asking, and um, spoiler alert, I'm going to write about it in tomorrow's morning brief. Is it something that you should be invested in? Is it something I should be invested in? Is it something that retail investors should be getting into? And if so, which one? How much? You know, what it, how is do it they like, think about be, it? I know, it's a, it's a very good It'll be fascinating to watch advisors answer that question. Yeah. I mean, do they think of it like gold? Because often you'll hear an advisor say, well, you know, it's 5% or 10% of your portfolio. You kind of dial it up or dial right. it down, depending on the environment. Is that where they go? We'll see. Very interesting. Yeah. Well, guess what? Coming up after the break, we're no. going to talk to one of the issuers who just got the this positive news. guest to have. Yes, exactly. The perfect, there he is. He's sitting right on set. And we're going to talk to him uh, in just a moment. Hashtex, that is the issuer we're going to be speaking to in just a moment. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news, three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with the ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. The Securities and Exchange Commission has just granted approval for spot Bitcoin ETFs. Our next guest today is with one of the firms that filed to have a spot Bitcoin ETF listed. It's Hashtag CIO and head of product, Samir Karbaj. Samir, first of all, just give us your sort of instant reaction here to this news. I mean, it could have been like uh, in a better moment, right? We to have this conversation. just for this, Samir. Yeah, we knew it was I just got the news while I was, while I was entering the studio. So it's, uh, I think it's a historical moment. We're very happy to see uh, their approval. I think it's the, the fact that this announcement came on Twitter. I think it says a lot about like uh, this whole process we've been uh, seeing in the last few months. Uh, so we're very excited. I think it's a historical moment, historical moment for Bitcoin, for, for the capital markets. Uh, we're going to see like an unprecedented moment where like 11 issuers are going to launch along the same timelines. Uh, there's a fee war going on. So, so it's definitely like uh, a very interesting topic to track. We're very excited about seeing this happening in the US. Uh, we, we already saw, like Hashtag saw this in other markets, and that has been transformational for crypto adoption and for mainstream adoption for investors, uh, uh, understanding the asset class, investment easy. So we're very excited to see this happening in the US, and I think this is going to have great consequences over the coming years. And, and Samir, investors are gonna have their choice, right? There'll be uh, different products you can yeah. choose from. How are they gonna decide that, Samir? You mentioned fees. Is that the variable, or are there others? I think there are multiple, uh, different types of investors, and they might prefer different uh, solutions. So you have the traders, uh, the hedge funds, 
those are the type of investors that are very sensi sensitive to liquidity. They tend to go to the product that has most liquidity. Uh, the product has, ha that has most liquidity tends to defend fees better. It tends to keep like, uh, fees higher for longer. Uh, and then you have investors that are very sensitive to fees. Those investors are going to like the lowest fee, whatever um, the, the fee is, whatever the issuer is, don't care, just go to the lowest uh, priced product. You have the investors that care about brand and those will tend to go with the big issuers, big names. And you have a certain part of the market which uh, we, we especially think that financial advisors and investment professionals are on that sector, that they still need to understand this asset class. They need to understand Bitcoin and how to allocate in the client portfolio and how much to allocate and, and what are the risks and keep track of the, the investment journey. And we believe that this type of investor will prefer a crypto specialist asset manager. And that's where we are positioned and there are others uh, positioned. So I think there's, there's a lot of space in this market. It's a huge market and it's not a winner takes all. Uh, but of course, everyone is going to track the coming days, who's going to track more uh, track Well, more I, I mean, and to be specific here, you guys, as far as I can tell, have the second highest fee of the 11 issuers at 0.9%, second only to Grayscale. How did you make, and it, that's, to be clear, you guys have a Bitcoin futures ETF currently. Yep. You are converting that product into a spot product, keeping the fee unchanged. How did, why did you make that decision to keep the fee unchanged so, when you know there are going to be flows towards yes. the lower fee issuers? Yeah, so Julie, this is a great question. Uh, first, it's important to highlight this product is already trading. Uh, and what we, we're requesting to the SEC and we're working with them is to change the investment strategy to allow it to hold spot. Okay, uh, so we're tracking what's happening with other products. The products are very different from ours. Uh, our product is, is very differentiated in terms of it holds spot and futures, uh, and it trades for the CME market, so it's a regulated market that has liquidity to support product. And we're tracking this fee war. We're seeing what's happening, and we're tracking this. Uh, what I can say is that we're not going to position uh, on a fee war. Uh, that's not how Hashtag is positioned. We are here to educate investors and to work with them in the long term. And we're going to find a price point that is going to be uh, beneficial for the investors and is going to be healthy for the industry. Now, I know you just got this news and it was from this tweet, um, but what do we know now? Now that you've got the approval, do you make the conversion tomorrow? Do you, when does it, when does it trade as a spot Bitcoin ETF? Do we know? That's a great question. So we don't have that answer <laughs> yet. Uh, you know, I just heard this right. news, uh, I mean, uh, from you. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I need to check with the team what we got from the SEC, what's happening. And, and um, there are two processes uh, happening in parallel. You have the 19 before the listing rule. Seems like this announcement is related to the listing right. rule. You also have the prospectus, the S1s, uh, the revision of the S1s, that process uh, will like the SEC will be when they are satisfied with the disclosures, they will let issuers uh, go effective. So I think that's going to be the next uh, uh, announcement to, to keep track of. And, and Samir, no, another question, folks. Oh, wait, I, you know what? I have to pause you here yeah, because go ahead. now it looks like now it looks like Gensler is saying that the SEC Twitter account was compromised. What? <laughs> <laughs> and an unauthorized tweet was posted. The SEC has not approved the listing and trading of spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. Now, that's unprecedented. That is unprecedented because, listen, um, as we said, it was strange to see a smiling Gary win. Gensler on yeah. this. You and I also spoke the other day, and it seemed like most of the issuers were going to find out not directly from a call or notification from the yeah. SEC but looking on the Federal Register when they yes. publish this. So again, just to be clear here, now wow. it seems like that there has not been approval as of yet. Wow. Gary Gensler, again, just to repeat this, initially there was a tweet from the official SEC government account saying that the spot Bitcoin ETFs had been approved. Now the Gary Gensler personal account, and hopefully we can believe that, saying that the Twitter account of the SEC was compromised and that the SEC has not approved the listing and trading of spot Bitcoin ETFs. So this is quite a drama that we are now seeing unfolding here. I'm just trying to look to see if we have gotten any comment from um, the SEC directly. Mm. I, I'm so sorry that you're on set here with us, Samir, while it you're just... Good, well, it's a good yeah. practice run. I yeah. mean, what a roller coaster. Well, let me ask you, Samir, look, but, but, but listen, the consensus we, we have gotten from any number of very smart guesses 
the SEC is going to green light this product. Are you as confident as so many others? Yes, at the end of the day, they are going to approve it. Listen, uh, I think it's a matter of time. Yeah. Um, the way we've been seeing them working, I think it's very positive. They are working hard to understand those products and to have like a, a position about this. Um, Everything that happened so far is unprecedented. Yeah. The way that they, ha they have interacted with issuers. Yeah, this is this pretty approval. wild. This is so, kind of unprecedented. I yeah. mean, we're very confident that they're they're understanding the product better and they might assess. Yeah. So so everyone's talking about they're going to approve. Like uh, hopefully that's mm. uh, that's going to happen uh, officially. Well, listen, sometime. I really want to apologize, okay. Samir, to you, to our viewers. I mean, listen. Um, on the one hand, you want to believe that what's posted on X, I said Twitter, X, um, is especially on an official yeah. government account, that that would be official. But shame on me. We should have been more suspicious that they would have yeah. done it in that way yeah. when the expectation was, A, that we would hear about this tomorrow, and B, that the SEC would not communicate in this way. So I'm sorry, Samir, and I'm sorry to our viewers that we did not get this right. right in this particular case, but as you say, unprecedented times. Yeah, and that's okay yeah. because like uh, we spoke the other day, like that's, they normally communicate for the official channels, right? right? Uh, but you know, we live in times where even Gary Gensler is tweeting every day about crypto and, and mm. giving his warning. So uh, would be unprecedented, but would not be a, a, a huge surprise, uh, but yeah, let's, Samir, it was still great to have you. Fantastic yeah, insight. No. I appreciate yeah, it. Was it was great. Thank it you so wonderful. much. wonderful. Thank you, Samir. Thank, Thank you for your patience. You. That was Samir there. We're heading up next more on Yahoo Finance on the other side of this break.
Breaking news, chaos over the approval of the spot Bitcoin ETF. I want to lay out for our viewers what just happened. First, there was a, a tweet from the official SEC government account that said all spot Bitcoin ETFs had been approved. Then, a short while later, Gary Gensler's personal account, account tweeting, the SEC Gov Twitter account was compromised and an unauthorized tweet was posted. The SEC has not approved the listing and trading of spot Bitcoin exchange traded products. There are so many implications of this. We were just speaking with Samir Kerbaj of yeah. Hashdex, who happened to be on the set. He's one of the issuers who is looking for this approval from the SEC. He had said that it was likely that there would not be a public-facing um, announcement, but rather you would look on the Federal Register, which is a, a website that a technical website that lists these filings. So it was shocking, and then equally shocking to find that this official account had indeed been hacked. Yeah, and our thanks again to Samir for rolling really, yes. really well with it. Um, it was uh, listen, it was surprising to see it posted on a social media platform, but when it comes from a verified government source, you're thinking you can go with it. Um, but we were both surprised that it came, it came, that they decided to announce that on X, kind of a smiling pic of Gary Gensler, but it has now been, been, been shifted here. And, and we were surprised by the timing as well, I think. Yes, well, yes, we were expecting this news perhaps to come tomorrow. I mean, I will say also, this doesn't reflect terribly well on X, that this hack was able to be enacted, right? That this happened on that platform. Um, to put out this fake tweet. Um, I, I want to bring in our team coverage on this as well. We've been working now for several weeks talking about the Spot Bitcoin ETF. Our own David Hollerith, who's been covering it, Jennifer Schonberger covering it from Washington. They are both here with more. Um, wow, you guys, <laughs> that's all I can say. David, let's start with you. Um, you have been reporting that what we were expecting, which we now still seem to be expecting, is that we'll get some kind of news tomorrow after the close of trading. Right, and uh, Julie, you know, it kind of helps to point out too, and, and you're well aware of this, is that the process of approving an ETF uh, by way of the SEC um, is pretty uh, bureaucratic and it, it takes a lot of time. And it's usually doesn't cater this much excitement um, from the investing public. Now, this has obviously been an exception given that Bitcoin, a Bitcoin ETF is something the industry has sought since, I mean, for the past decade. Um, so, you know, all of, I guess, through the second half of 2023, we saw anticipation building around this. And so now, you know, we're at this point where you, it's a pretty uh, nebulous um, internal agency process. Um, and everybody has been trying to sort of get around this to understand when approval could happen um, because it's, it is uh, such a closed process. Um, and all because of that, you take that on, on top of all of these people who were trying to come up with, you know, when the approval could actually happen. And it kind of creates this recipe where a lot of people want to believe the latest thing that happened. When this first came out, obviously, it's not very characteristic of the SEC to be issuing a statement. And uh, traditionally, they're pretty close or they're pretty tight lipped about um, voicing these processes. And, and it usually comes out through um, SEC filings is where we see this. And Jennifer, I want to bring you in here as well. I mean, it was surprising, Jennifer, to see this um, news posted on a social media platform, to see it posted on X. But, you know, often, you listen, you see a verified government account, you think you can trust it. Uh, what was your re response to it? Yeah, you know, Josh, to your point, I was a bit skeptical at first too. I kind of went and said, is this definitely the SEC's account? Yeah, it looks like it. But to your point and to David's point, generally the SEC is not going to put their approval on Twitter now X first. It's gonna come in the form of a filing on Edgar. And the SEC scrambling coming out with a statement just moments ago, a spokesperson telling me that the SEC's Twitter account had been compromised and that, quote, the unauthorized tweet regarding Bitcoin's ETF was not made by the SEC or its staff. So this is also something for X to look into as well when it comes to hackers. Well, definitely. And that unauthorized tweet stayed up on the official SEC page for 
10 minutes at least. Um, I just checked once again. It has now been taken down. It has been erased. The Gensler tweet obviously uh, remains there, guys. Um, so, okay, so let's level set then and assume we're back to where we were, that perhaps we will hear news about the spot Bitcoin ETFs tomorrow. Perhaps then they'll start trading at some point in the future. Um, you know, what are you hearing from the issuers at this point, David, in terms of, I mean, this might have scrambled things a little bit, certainly surprised people. Um, but what are you hearing from the issuers in terms of what they're now expecting? Um, to, to be honest, we haven't uh, had time to speak yeah, with this is uh, all unfolding very issues. quickly. <laughs> yeah, since this has <laughs> happened, um, you know, the kind of the from what we heard from applicants, the expectation was uh, approval for, for some time on on Wednesday with trading beginning on Thursday. And, you know, we can't begin to understand how this might change the calculus, if at all. Um, but one thing I guess we could take um, in light of all this is that we did get to see a brief uh moment of, of of what happens to the Bitcoin price when if uh, approval is to come out. And so now that we kind of know that things were a little bit uh, volatile and shaky after that. Um, but again, um, it, it's likely not going to be the same. And Jennifer, I want to get your take on that as well. Listen, we're, we're, we're guessing here, but do you think an event like this, in your opinion, does it upend the timing or, or no? You think the SEC stays dead set? They've made a decision. They've got a timeline in mind. They're, they're going to go with it. Well, they've got a deadline when it comes to ARC, so they still have to legally meet that deadline. So hack or no, we're going to have a decision on this by tomorrow or maybe Thursday at the latest. Now, there are obviously more than one applicants. We've got Grayscale, we've got BlackRock, the list goes on. You know, is the SEC going to do this in one slew and one batch or are we going to see sort of a trickle down? You know, that remains to be seen. And then will there be an effective date for trading so that all of these can begin trading on the same day to create sort of a level playing field? You know, these are all questions. And then from there, you know, to Chair Gensler, what is it that has changed in his mind and in, in the agency's mind that they no longer believe that it's going to be subject to market manipulation? And frankly, does this give them more uh, power, more ability to better regulate crypto if they become a regulated exchange traded product? Jen, I, I, I'm curious, this, this all happening does this give the SEC any legal cover to delay? Because, right, it, it is as part of a legal decision that they have to let ARK and 21 shares know by tomorrow. Tomorrow is the deadline. I, I mean, I know we're not legal experts here, but I, does this ch is there any chance this could change the timeline? I was going to say, I'm not a legal expert, yeah. so in my view, and not having done any due diligence on this, um, you know, I wouldn't think it would, but... Who knows? Yeah, and I will say the one, uh, the official communication we did get today, by the way, from the Securities and Exchange Commission is something on investor.gov by the SEC's Director of Investor Education and Adv Advocacy, um, which basically warns about some of the pitfalls of, of cryptocurrencies or that investors need to exercise caution. So that's the official word that is all we have today from the SEC. So just something to note. Um, as we try to figure out our way through this situation, Josh. And Dave, I want to get your, you made, a, you made an interesting point there too, Dave. For however brief, that brief window in time where we thought the approval was there, we did see a reaction in Bitcoin. Because that's an interesting, listen, that's another really important question we've been asking, Dave, is, is if and when you get the approval, how Bitcoin reacts, is it a positive catalyst, right? Or is it, is it going to be a sell the news event? Yeah, I mean, I think you can't really uh, you can't really expect um, anything uh, good to happen when it's supposed to with Bitcoin, given the amount of uh, derivatives that are like trading in the market. Um, but longer term, a lot of people do think that the ETFs, um, by giving more access to investors, um, will uh, substantially help um, how uh, the Bitcoin market trades. Um, and it will bring in more flows. I mean, we have really big uh, Wall Street names coming in, wanting to issue these kinds of products. Um, that being said, you know, obviously the question of manipulation, um, the, really what led to this uh, moment of, for approval uh, was Grayscale's lawsuit um, with the uh, against the SEC, as far as we know. 
And in that lawsuit, it was based basically based on how the SEC argued uh, manipulation in the Bitcoin markets worked and whether it was different from the future markets. So if we take all that and to get in, in kind together, I, I think um, sort of the question here is just kind of, um, you know, what, uh, you know, what exactly is um, is the SEC able to argue that is different now as opposed to how it was an hour ago? David, Jennifer, thank you both so much for joining us here today and, and helping us make sense of what turned out to be a wild news day. We appreciate it. Thank you. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance on the other side of this break. Yahoo Finance is out at CES 2024 and one of the big topics on everyone's mind. There is a AI computers and our very own Akiko Fujita caught up with some of the biggest names in tech to chat about the future of PCs. Take a listen. Yahoo Finance is on the ground here in Las Vegas at CES 2024 where the PC is having a moment. Specifically, we're talking about AI PCs. We sat down with executives from Intel, Lenovo, HP, and Dell to talk about how the integration of AI technology into devices is likely to transform the PC experience. So much of the conversation over the last year has been AI in the cloud. 
This is really that pivot point where we're talking about AI in devices. Why is that such a game changer? Well, it's a game changer because you can take these large language models that have been in cloud, this kind of ambiguous set of experiences that no one tangibly could actually ever touch or hold, and now you've brought it with into the CPU with this neural processing unit where you allow it to run locally on the machine. And you allow that localization to be personalized to you. So whatever is most important to you from an AI perspective, you now can do it on your machine. Whether you're connected to the internet or not, you have that power within the PC. And that's the real game changer, right? You know, one of the words we've used internally is to think about AI gives you superpowers. It allows you to summarize dramatic amounts of information much more quickly. So imagine if AI can be looking at your schedule, summarizing your emails, telling you what your most important things are for the day, as well as telling you, hey, you're not going to make this appointment. Should I make these changes? Those are all things that are kind of intangibles, but once they're part of your daily life, things that you're not willing to give up because they've made it easier. It will do what you do in two hours in two minutes. So it will bring, bring, bring tremendous productivity. The more visible feature is this co-pilot key when you touch it, it will trigger all the, a the AI functionality in the cloud. What's amazing about AI is that now we're training the device, we're training models, so that it learns human. It will anticipate me, it will be far more personalized to me. And that's a step function change. It's more than just faster, a little bit more. It is different because it's more personalized, and that's a revolution of what was always intended to be a personal computer. It's really going to become personalized. Yeah, I think we, we are in the beginning of the AI kind of era, and we're in like early innings for that. If you do go back a couple years, I would say the PC, we had the renaissance of the PC as you think about COVID, and people kind of woke up to, hey, this is a great device, a really important companion. And you think about today now going, okay, taking that thing that kept me connected during those times to it's going to become this personal companion that will help me be more efficient in everything that I do. Early estimates are that we would expect at least 40 to 50% of the PCs in the next three years will be AI PC enabled. And with a, um, a richer set of configs that enable that, that, uh, that can help double the growth rate of the PC industry. We are confident that the AI PC will be an inflection point and that will accelerate the replacement cycle. You think about that potential for upgrades and people refreshing their PCs is pretty enormous to have the latest technology that lets them be more productive at work or get more done at home on their PC. So something very tangible, something you can't do on your machine today that you can do on your machine tomorrow. We're hoping that this spurs this inflection point of refresh and getting people to go and buy a new PC and have new experiences. And if I can make an analogy, this might do what the smartphone has done to the phone. If you think about that, the smartphone gradually has completely erased the phone category and everybody has upgraded to smartphone. AIPC is going to do the same for PC. Great stuff there from Akiko. Be sure to stay tuned all week long for our exciting coverage of CES 2024. And coming up, watch to watch, what to watch tomorrow, we break down the stories you need to know to start your day.
Here's what to watch tomorrow after today's Proctor guys, a little up, a little up, there we go. After today's chaos following the SEC's X account being compromised and sending out a false approved, we will return to normalcy, we hope, and continue to look to tomorrow's deadline to see if they will get the go ahead. It is widely expected to okay the first funds to hold the token with names such as Grayscale, ARK Investments, and Hashtex, who we just heard from, all hopeful, of course, to be approved. All eyes are going to be on Iowa, meantime, as Republican presidential candidates will hold another debate and GOP frontrunner Donald Trump will hold a town hall on Fox News. It comes just five days before the Iowa caucuses kick off the party's White House nominating race. And on the earnings front, we're going to get the Q4 read from KB Homes after the bell. Wall Street expecting the company to post a lower revenue than this time last year, and lower earnings per share despite the stock being up around 80 percent in that time frame. And we'll get fresh economic insight from the Federal Reserve's John Williams. He'll be making a keynote speech on his 2024 economic outlook. But really, what we'll be watching tomorrow, <laughs> again, especially yes. again, especially after the close of trading, is whether the Securities and Exchange Commission will really approve mm. those 11 spot Bitcoin ETFs after what we just witnessed, um, an unauthorized tweet being sent from the official SEC account, then Gary Gensler's personal account coming out and saying, nope, no, we didn't do it. We didn't well, approve it. And them. the thing is that you, I mean, yes, it was unusual that it would come across on social media on X, but there is this theory now, which we were just talking about, which is that the part of, one, it was a verified government account. Right. Right. And two, and you, you would check that, right? Because you were thinking like, well, what, on X? But you checked it. But also because the language was very SEC-like. Sure. And uh, Eric Balchunas, who we spoke to recently yep. from Bloomberg Intelligence, he's an ETF expert, one of the people who's really been tracking this very closely. He said it's possible that this was a scheduled tweet that was supposed right. to go out tomorrow. And they put the wrong date. That was mis fired yeah. in some way, you know, there's a chance we'll never figure out, Yeah, <laughs> but we'll be tracking it in oh, the next day Same or time, so. same place tomorrow. We'll yeah. be here. All right, that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. <sighs> Have a good night.